Welcome to the Trilobite Report, where we report on what's new in prehistory. I'm Sean P. Meddy. This is our inaugural episode, and we want to thank you for joining us here today. Before we begin, we'd like to encourage you to comment on what subjects you'd like to see us reporting on. And while you're doing that, if you feel so inclined, consider subscribing. Now with that business out of the way, on to our lead story. Cancer. Cancer? This is our first episode and we're leading with cancer? There's no other subjects we could have started with? All right, fine, fine, fine. <clears throat> I apologize, let me do that again. Our lead story, cancer. The Smithsonian Magazine recently reported on a new study originally published in The Lancet that provides the most detailed evidence yet for cancer in a dinosaur. A multidisciplinary team led by a paleontologist and pathologist studied the bone inside and out, examining everything from the outside shape to the inner microscopic structure. In the end, the experts arrived at the diagnosis of osteosarcoma a malignant bone cancer that afflicts about 3.4 out of every million people worldwide today. Discovering osteosarcoma in a dinosaur has implications for the evolutionary origins of the history of cancer. According to Catherine Foster, George Washington University's paleontologist, if humans and dinosaurs get the same kinds of bone cancers, then bone cancers develop deep in our evolutionary history before the mammal and reptile split about 300 million years ago. The bone infected with this Cretaceous cancer comes from a centrosaur, a member of the Ceratopsian family. This family also includes other very prominent members, such as the Triceratops, the Protoceratops, the Styracosaurus, and Cynoceratops, to name a few. Royal Ontario Museum paleontologist David Evans and McMaster University pathologist specialist, specialist Mark Crother surveyed hundreds of fossils from the Royal Tyrell Museum's collections before rediscovering the centrosaur fibia. The injury to the bone didn't look like a break. It looked like a great candidate for cancer. Experts in musculoskeletal oncology and human pathology examined the bone in detail from its outer physical appearance to its inner structure using a high-resolution X-ray CT scan and confirmed the diagnosis of osteosarcoma. On the bright side, the centrosaur did not die from cancer. As it was found inside a bone bed among a herd of centrosaurs, it most likely died from drowning in a flash flood. Wait, that's the bright side? It died in a flash. It didn't. The cancer didn't get it, but it died from drowning. What sort of? Yes, yes. I'll stick to the script. A link to the article. A link to the article for the Smithsonian will be placed in the description of the video. For more on how this is now affecting our Mesozoic community, we go out to our dino on the street, Nick Rafterton. Nick, glad to have you on the team. How are you doing today? <laughs> oh, fine, fine. Well, tell me, Nick, this is rather some developing and disturbing, interesting news. Uh, how do you feel about it? Well, Nick, this is some interesting information coming out of the Cretaceous period. Uh, how has this affected your perception of health in the dinosaur community? Interesting. Never thought of it from that perspective. Very, very good reporting, Nick. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Thank you for that report. Now on to our second story. The smallest dinosaur that has ever lived has been discovered. In a recent article published in Nature, China University of Geosciences paleontologist Li Da Xing and his colleagues described the 99 million year old fossil that was found in Myanmar. Paleontologists have encountered many creatures in amber, however what makes this specimen stand out is just exactly how small it is. 
The newly discovered dinosaur, preserved within hardened resin during the mid-Cretaceous period of the Mesozoic era, is represented enough by nothing more than its skull. From its tiny teeth to the delicate ringed bones of its eyes, it only measures half an inch long. It is apparent that this little creature was a toothed bird that lived during the reign of its dinosaur kin. Shing and his co-authors have named it Oculodentivus cahurungari. What was that? I mispronounced the Latin on the second word. All right, I'm going to just keep moving forward. Have named it Oculodentivus... Oculodent... Ocula... What was that? I shouldn't try to pronounce either Latin word. Got it. The genus being derived from tooth-eyed bird in Latin. In life, Oculodentivit, Oculodentivit. Yes, I received the note from the last time. I just wanted, I'm not the one that put the Latin word back in the, the teleprompter. Oculodentivit, Oculodentivit, Oculo, Just skip over the word? That sounds like a plan. In life, oculodentivus, I heard you. In life, oculodentivus. In life, it would have been about the size of a small hummingbird. The stature makes it the tiniest Mesozoic dinosaur yet discovered, significantly smaller than other contenders for the title, such as the Fruitidens in Colorado. Yes, I know, I pronounce. What? Really? It almost makes up for me uh, messing up the Latin that much. Yes, absolutely. Run it through. Put it in the prompter. Sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen. There has been an update. Apparently, the smallest dinosaur discovered is no longer a dinosaur. The scientists have retracted their original article and reports and are now saying that the specimen most likely belongs to a lizard and not a dinosaur following new evidence from a similar fossil. The authors of the paper published in Nature say that their original description of the fossil, a bird-like skull with a uh, bird-like skull less than two centimeters long, its mouth packed with dozens of teeth, is still accurate, but they acknowledge that its classification as a dinosaur is inaccurate. Jingmai O'Connor, a paleontologist at the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing, who co-led the now retracted study, says that the new data definitely says that we were wrong, but the specimen could, cannot be reclassified until other fossil data are published. Although the fossil was no longer thought to be the smallest known dinosaur, O'Connor says that it's still compelling because of its unusual combination of features. The specimen is still very interesting to science. We apologize for any confusion that the earlier report may have caused. At the Trilobite Report, we want to make sure that we are providing you the most up-to-date information. And now, on to entertainment news. There has been a lot of development and teases coming from the set of Jurassic World Dominion. The sequel to Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is to act not only as a conclusion to the Jurassic World trilogy, but also tie in the original Jurassic Park trilogy as well. We will be reporting on developments as the movie continues to film, and we get reports from the set. Today, we have three small reports to, uh, to present to you. The first is a post by Bryce Dallas Howard, who plays Claire Deering in the Jurassic World films. In a recent tweet, Howard posts, Raise your hands if you're happy to be doing stunts again! It appears that some of the dinosaurs in the film have uh, no quarrels about roughing up their human co-stars. We hope the remainder of the filming is not as rough on Bryce. Hello, old friend. For those of us that are lovers of the first Jurassic Park film are undoubtedly familiar with that hat. Sam Neill recently tweeted that image along with the phrase, Hello, old friend, from the set of Jurassic World Dominion. Sam Neill played the iconic character Dr. Alan Grant in the original Jurassic Park trilogy. He will be reprising his role in Jurassic World Dominion alongside other returning favorites, Laura Dern as Dr. Ellie Sattler and Jeff Goldblum as Dr. Ian Malcolm. Personally, I'm very excited to see how Dr. Ellie Sattler and Dr. Alan Grant interact with other Jurassic World characters such as uh, specifically Chris Pratt's Owen Grady and Bryce Howard's Claire Deering. 
Our final in this trio of stories is an official photo released by Jurassic World Dominion and reported by Jurassic World Outposts. The photo from the set at first doesn't show anything significant, however a closer inspection will indicate a specific location. At the bottom of the container, you can clearly see it say, Site B is La Sorna. This marking indicates that we may have a chance to once again be returning to the off-site breeding facility of dinosaurs that we saw in the second and third Jurassic Park films. We know the filming locations in the movie have been filming all around the world in varying climates, so the whole movie won't take place on Sorna, if any of it does at all. It's popular opinion that this is more than likely a flashback scene. Of course, we won't know more until the film is released. Before we finish this episode, we would like to say that the new trailer for Netflix's Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous has recently been released. And we will be doing a trailer breakdown in, the, in a future video, as well as episode reactions to the series when it's released in September. And with that, we've come to the conclusion of this episode of the Trailer Bite Report. For myself, Nip Rapterton, and the crew here at S'mores and Dinosaurs, we thank you for watching. We encourage you to subscribe, and until next time, stay curious. Can't wait for that Jurassic World movie to come out. What was that? Yeah, I'll, 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 I pronounced the Latin correct in the rehearsals. Ocula dentiventus. Ocula dementus. Ocula Ocula dementus. Ocula dementus. Ocula dementus. Does it really matter? It's not a dinosaur anymore.